this. Linda, how would you describe a good death? Um, Having seen so many. Yes. Um, so good planning, symptom control, good preparation from a practical perspective, um, reconciliation where there's conflict and um, goodbyes and communion with family, things like that. Um, and there's um, that sense of wanting to be seen as a person, as a, as a full whole person. I think I, from my own experience, would add two things to that. First would be um, the absence of fear or at least a way of managing the fear that approaches us when we're um, facing death. Um, and this, and a couple with that, I think the reframing of hope. Um, the reframing of hope. Yep, yep. The okay. reframing of hope. That's enough. That's that's <laughs> pl that's plenty, Colleen. Well, a lot of what I was going to say, Linda has just said. Um, but I would add, um, for me, a good death, as well as all of those things, includes absolutely not receiving unwanted and unwarranted. Um, procedures and treatment because one of the biggest problems we're facing at the moment is too much futile care. And, and, you're, and you want that for yourself? <coughs> like you, you're confident that you would want that? Not only would I want it, I have written an advance directive and appointed a patient advocate to make sure that I get it. Oh. Um, I also think being in the place that the person wants to die, if that's possible, or where I would want to die, okay. um, and it might not necessarily be at home. But also to have around you the people that you love and are loved by, as Frank said, but that might not be um, your biological family and I think people need to understand that too. That's very interesting. Andrew? I'm going to read you someone else's words, but first of all, I, I think I speak for most Australians when I say I would like to die being hit by a comet while having sex. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that's universal and uh, Frank said that to me just before he came <laughs> in. <laughs> this is actually yes. from uh, Corey Taylor who's a Queensland author who is in the last stages of cancer, and she wrote to me on this very subject, and I think this is a beautiful definition of a good death. It is the, the desire for your wishes to be respected and acted upon. It is the desire for yourself and your family to be spared futile and unnecessary suffering at the end. It is the desire to be fully present for those you love at the moment you leave them. I think that's pretty good. OK. And yeah. Leslie in Melbourne. Gee, I really like that one that Andrew just provided. But I suppose when you get involved in this area, you, you become aware of how many how uncertainties there are. So I suppose for me, because what I want is to have my family around me, my children, my partner, and I want to be at home and feel kind of safe. And I worry that I won't be able to say, I've had enough, I want to check out. OK. Well, look, thank you all. Um, to maybe put this in some context, let's have a look at the history of thinking about death and dying. Before modern hospitals and sophisticated medical treatments, death might be swift or the result of lingering illness, but it was accepted that the manner and timing of a person's death was in the hands of providence. Death usually happened at home and was accompanied by age-old rites and rituals that brought comfort to the dying and to loved ones left behind. But over the last 60 years or so, the experience of dying in the developed world has been disrupted. We are light years away from the concept of pneumonia as an old person's friend. As people live longer and longer, the process of dying can also be prolonged. Antibiotics? CPR and ventilators have become the routine and the ritual of 21st century end-of-life care. However, some are agitating for the right to seek medical assistance to help end their lives when they choose. I am so afraid, not of dying, but of the way I will die. In an increasingly secular medical landscape, with its bewildering array of options, the territory between life and death is constantly being renegotiated. So how has science and medicine disrupted the dying process? Now, Linda, this is absolutely your territory. Look, I think um, you know, before we had the modern technology that we see in medical practice today, dying was in our living rooms, it was in our families, it was very much a part of how we understood ourselves and very much a part of our communities. And I think increasingly, as technology has advanced, we've seen it more in institutions, in hospitals, more medicalised over time. 
Um, and um, that has, I guess, dislocated it a little bit from our consciousness, if you like, as human beings. It's not an ideal situation, is it? I mean, mostly we're, we're vaguely rehearsed for some of the huge decisions we're asked to make. Absolutely. I think there's, there's increasingly poor death literacy, if you like. Um, talking about death will help us understand better how to do it well. And have you found this in your work, Colleen? I have, except that um, when people say to me, you know, if I say, what are you afraid of? Yes. And they say, well, I, I'm, I'm afraid of not get, getting adequate pain relief. And that makes me actually very angry. Because if people understand the law and even understand what, for example, the Catholic Church allows, giving as much pain relief as is needed, even if it hastens death, is not euthanasia. It is not doctor-assisted dying. And it is legally available now. But the reason I say that even the Catholic Church accepts it was the first person to use that term was St Thomas Aquinas. And Aquinas said, if you must achieve a good end, in this case, relief of pain, mm. and the only way you can achieve that good end is to also run the risk of a foreseen but unintended secondary consequence, hastening death by a few hours or days, you must still achieve the good end. There is no excuse for leaving a terminally ill person in pain. That is an abuse of human rights. May I say I agree with Colin, I'm cutting in straight away because this misconception around titration of opioids hastening death is now officially debunked. Um, mm. Best practice palliative care, the best available data to date have shown categorically that proportional titration of opioids for pain control at the end of life does not hasten death. But the life. nurses and doctors that I, I do my research with don't know that. I agree. There well, is a well, very well, common how, how misconception. How could they possibly not know that? <laughs> well, look, my, my sister no, died I mean, in September 2012. Could... Her daughter phoned me. I was her advocate. Her daughter phoned me and said, Aunt Nicole, she's in pain. And I just spoke to a nurse and she said, we gave her something two hours ago. I said, not good enough, Annie. Yeah. Are you up for another challenge? I'd given her a few during the process. I said, out to the desk, say to the nurse, my uh, mother is in pain. That's unacceptable. Please have something done about it. I agree. When I and hear those did, stories... And I... the doctor went and upped her morphine, upped her medication. Okay, so, so she... Need, well, that's exactly why we wanted to have this conversation. The doctor said she gets pain relief every five minutes if she needs it. Those are the words, Linda, if she needs it, and she should never have been in pain. Thank so you, Linda. So the point that whether or not it hastens death, you do what's necessary to relieve the pain. Absolutely. If there's a request to relieve the pain... Absolutely. ..you relieve the pain. I generally agree with every, everything you're saying, but there are two problems with that. One is there is some pain that it is beyond uh, the reach of medical science, even the best palliative science, uh, to, to deal with and, and to solve. And then secondly, and this is more difficult, but uh, one of the uh, a senior palliative care physician I spoke to who, has, uh, who works at, at a Catholic uh, palliative care facility said to me very clearly, it wouldn't matter what the law says, my ethics instruct me that I would not assist someone to die. But he also said he fundamentally believed he could help people... Yes, he did. ..to but, live while they had life left. But he also man. acknowledged, he said, I cannot say I can manage everybody's pain. Mm. So it's in that small gap that I think this question lies. I am not debating whether or not there are a very small number of people that may continue to have distress at the end of life, despite the best possible painkillers, mm. but they are extremely small numbers. What we're talking about is the 99.99% of patients who are at the end of life who need good palliative care, good pain control, good symptom control. If I could just say, when we talk about extremely small numbers, uh, there's about 20,000 people uh, die in palliative care. And the best estimate of those that can't be helped, whose pain is intractable, is somewhere between 3 and 5%. So we're talking 6 to 1,000 Australian every year, uh, Australians every year, but we're not just talking about them, but we're talking about elderly Australians who coroners have revealed are uh, suiciding in very ugly ways because of intractable, irreversible illnesses. Mm. We're also talking about people outside of the palliative care system who, for instance, uh, may have multiple sclerosis or motor neurone disease, for whom palliative care is never going to be uh, a response to a long-term disease. So it's, it's a small number within palliative care, but it's not a small number in total. Let me just see what Leslie thinks about this. I don't think it's a problem for individual practitioners to have a moral, you know, have a religiously based or a conscience-based view that they don't want to be involved in something like assisted dying or a, a certain way of medic medicating someone. I think the issue is a systems issue. I think it's really important to respect 
people's consciences as long as what's enabled is for that not to affect patient care because another physician whose conscience tells them differently can step in and provide the care the patient wants. So if the patient's at the centre and we really believe that and we incarnate it in the sort of documents that Colleen is talking about, we then need to respect it. it, it the patient should be making the decisions and leaving instructions so that their decisions can be carried yes, out. Yes, but Leslie, Regardless they're asking the wrong wants. question at the wrong time. I've been in a, an intensive care unit when a woman ca came in unconscious and the husband was asked by a young registrar in the middle of a busy ward, did she ever say if she'd want to be resuscitated? Or, or saying to the family, do you want everything done? I've heard doctors ask them that. Now, it's the wrong question. Of course they're going to say yes. So what's the or right question? The right question is to have the discussion and get people to complete their advanced before. directives way before. 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 While they're still fit and healthy, I've completed my advanced directive, I've appointed my substitute decision makers, there is no problem. It's like the worst kind of homework though, an advanced care directive. In that you don't want to think about it, and I was going to ask, would you mind doing mine? <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I actually do help people complete their advanced directives. Thank you. And can I just say, Geraldine, very quickly, it can help cement relationships. So I've had this discussion with my sons too, and mm. in, instead of it being this terrible discussion, I found mm. quite the opposite. Mm. I agree with um, enabling patients choices I agree with um, our goals of care particularly as we approach dying need to be very much directed by the patient's goals and values however I don't necessarily endorse this individualist version of autonomy that is operationalised in this kind of context and is often talked about. Are you implying there that um, you think it's got to be a group decision? Is that what you mean by this? Oh, not at all. I think that all, all the people that are making decisions, even where it's granny in the bed who is no longer able to make her decisions on her own, everybody around that decision-making table, their focus and priority needs to be her preferences, wishes, and where, what they were when they were capable, but also what they are now when she's no longer capable. And the law, Geraldine, actually, um, the reason we have a guardianship legislation which, which sets out who the decision maker is to be if you haven't appointed your own, mm. and it's not next of kin, and can everybody please get that very clear, it is not next of kin, it is to support autonomy, because it starts with spouse, including de facto or same-sex partner, if there is one. If there isn't, it moves to non-professional carer, often a younger daughter or daughter-in-law. And there might be an older son or some other person who considers themselves next of kin. But who's most likely to know what this person in the bed that Linda was talking about would want? And it's the person who's pro been providing the day-to-day -day care. And in a case in the New South Wales Guardianship Tribunal, it turned out to be the next-door neighbour, even though the woman had three children right. whom she hardly ever saw. I want to ask you, Frank Brennan, um, what, uh, there's a great deal of sort of assumptions made around the role of religion in this. Um, it's almost religion versus uh, the world of medicine. Is that how you see it as a Catholic priest? No. In fact, I mean, we live in a pluralist society. I, I know it can be a cheap point to say some things are religious things. You've got questions about striking an appropriate balance between the personal autonomy of the person who's capable over against the state's interest in ensuring the protection of those who are not autonomous or who don't have those same collection of abilities. I mean, religious people often may f fall on one side of the equation, but I think in philosophical terms and in jurisprudential legal terms, these are balancing issues which confront everyone, whether they're religious mm. or secular. I must say, Andrew, um, in preparing for this, I read very little about religion and a lot about ethics I suppose I'd say, and it did occur to me, you know, that it, is it possible it's the absence of religion, the decline of religion, which has fed into an acute fear and, of death and lack of repertoire for discussing it? Look, I think the fear of death is universal and has been unchanged through all of human history, regardless of your religious beliefs. But I do think that's a, a reasonable point, that we have lost a certain amount of ritual in an increasingly secular society. Frankly, I broadly agree with everything uh, you just put there. But there's, there's one thing I'd, I'd like to rephrase, which is uh, this question of autonomy versus the public good. I don't think it's a versus thing. And I think one of the things I've found as I've explored this question is I get troubled by the sense that the idea that assisted dying and the public good may somehow be out of balance with each other. Uh, and, you know, we talk about coercion and the vulnerable, as indeed we should. But what I have discovered is that the greatest coercion on the most vulnerable people uh, is on those who have no choice 
in this question, who have no medical choice, have no legal choice what about how mean? they what die. What do you mean? Well, for instance, uh, for elderly Australians who may face chronic, irreversible, terrible illnesses, who have no legal way to be assisted to die, so they're suiciding. But if they wish to, and Palliative Care Australia acknowledges this, uh, clearly and persistently request a right to a hasten death, they don't have that option, so they're being coerced into being put into a coma till they die. Now, it's not coercion in the sense of, we're going to force you to do, to do this, that is just the reality of it. So there are people who are dying are at their most vulnerable. And I believe that the fact that this is not an option that sits within our medical system uh, creates a situation where those vulnerable people are being coerced into things that they don't necessarily well, it, want. It, does it create more anxiety? So, I mean, are you sure that we, all your passion and in, a, energy for this project is not adding to people's anxiety? No, I think people's anxiety is already there. And this is, this is what it's shown for years and years and years. There is a, a loud and persistent request for this conversation to be had properly and for these options to be offered. I got an email from somebody after I did a promo at the end of Compass last week. Uh, I got this from an oncologist. Ask Andrew Denton why none of the practitioners dedicated to treating and advocating for people in need of care with terminal illnesses are calling for the legal right to kill. First of all, I think when he uses the expression to kill, it's kind of a bit of a tell yes. because that is a, that is a deliberately weighted expression. And I think it's very important uh, wherever you come from in this conversation to understand that where these laws exist the vast majority of the people to whom they apply are people who are dying they're not being killed they are dying and most of them the majority are in the last days of their life and oddly enough if I tell me if I'm wrong but it's very interesting a lot of them request the medication but they don't use it that's the other interesting thing which is so what's all that, that well, well but that's it's speaks about, of anxiety to me it's about control it's about taking away the 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 suffering and Linda will talk to this it's a lot of pain can be managed, not all, as we just discussed earlier, but it's existential suffering, which is a much broader question about the anguish that surrounds death, mm. loss of control, loss of life, farewells, and that, but that's genuine suffering. It is still pain. Uh, Maybe... That is the question. Just in final answer to that correspondent that... is that, yes, of course there are doctors that are calling for this law, and I, and I will quote one to him right now, which is the father of Australian palliative care, Professor Ian Maddox, who basically has said that if uh, compassionate care for the dying is part of palliative care, then assisted dying should be considered as part of that. All right, Leslie, how, would, how do you think the community as a whole could be discussing this better? I think we need to discuss it. I just find the whole, dis the whole suggestion that somehow talking about this is problematic in and of itself, and that if we don't talk about it, it'll go away. It's death. It's not going anywhere. We're all going to face it. And we all now have additional anxieties, which is where you started in the program, because of the way we are dying. Colin, have you seen it done well? Yes. Um, I think sometimes when a, a lot of older people say to me, I wanted to talk to my family about it, but they, they said, oh, mum, don't be morbid. So I, I've suggested things like wait until you're watching a TV show and say, what would you want in that situation? Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, as I did with my children, I said, if you don't talk to me about this now, if we can't discuss this, when the time comes and you need to make my decisions, if you make the wrong one, I'll come back and haunt you. <laughs> um, so, but no, Terribly but, constructive. <laughs> terribly constructive. But, you know, I, I do think that the more we start talking about it among our families and, and each other, um, the more it will help. Frank. I'm just thinking of a Jesuit I lived with. He was in his late 70s. He had a leukaemia. I went along to the GP with him the day that he was told that he would have to start dialysis. And he just said to his doctor, I'm not going to have dialysis. And he walked out of that room. He had a great equanimity about him. He died within a few months. Mm -hmm. He could have lived for years mm -hmm. on dialysis. Mm -hmm. He made a self-determining decision. Mm -hmm. I think it was not only a moral decision, I think it was a wonderful decision. Mm -hmm. And it's about that capacity as self-determining individuals that we can exercise that autonomy. I mean, this fellow, he had a PhD from Oxford. He was no fool. Uh, but he just said he'd made his decision. But that's the point, that Frank. That. He had a PhD from Oxford. A lot of the older people I work with, they are, particularly if they're admitted to hospital, in, where they often shouldn't be, particularly going from a residential aged care facility or from home, into a hospital, they get on the hospital treadmill and they are definitely coerced into accepting a whole lot of treatment. But usually, I mean, I went through this with my mother, a decent aged care, the first thing you do once you're admitted is you, you make an advanced care directive. So why isn't that? 
that happen? I mean, well, this is about lack 60% of confidence. 60% of people who are now being admitted to residential care already have dementia. We've got to move advanced care planning back into the community, into GP surgeries, um, and help people to articulate their values, their beliefs, their wishes. Okay. Can, can I say, one of the really surprising things I've discovered over the last year as I've been talking about this, and which I hadn't expected to find, is uh, that Australian doctors are uncomfortable with the subject. I there was a yes. survey done by the yeah, yeah. Royal Australian College of Physicians mm -hmm. last year of 1,500 doctors. 80% mm -hmm. of them uh, were unaware of and had not uh, at length discussed their patients' end-of-life wishes. Yeah. I agree with Leslie. This is a conversation which should be had in every family. You know, my father used to joke to us, I want to die by walking into a, an Olympic-sized pool filled with single malt whiskey and just keep walking. We had these conversations. Yeah, yeah. But it, I think the it medical... No comments profession. that year. <laughs> That's right. But my research shows that the patients want the doctor to raise the issue. Yeah, yeah. Right. Repeatedly they say, yes, I want to talk about this, but I want my doctor to raise the subject. The elephant in the room, dare I say, is dementia. Oh dear, this is such a difficult area. Um, and a, a part of the problem though, I think, is that many of our structures around medical ethics and our talking around bioethics is really endorse this very individualistic version of autonomy, of operationalising autonomy, where you have to be you know, voluntary, independent, good decision making, able to integrate information, all of the pieces that drive informed consent, that drive advanced directive type discussions. So in the dementia patient, for example, this comes back to focusing on the person in the bed, not what their expressed wishes were when they were competent or capable necessarily, but what is important now is still there in the bed. I mean, can, can does theology help us on this or not? I don't know that theology does, but I think that what does help us is that the real challenge in relation to dementia is that for example, with Andrew's suggestion that we move to assistance with dying, that where we have patients who are suffering dementia, even if there be an advanced care directive, that I would like the doctors to take a positive step to terminate my life in a particular instance, as dementia sets in, whether or not we can be satisfied that the patient is still in a sense of that view or what fears yeah. there might be that have been exacerbated as a result of the dementia. But you know, and, Frank, and I think that's, that's it, a very difficult area, is, as I say. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah, theological it, it, answer In the Netherlands, it. you can actually request assistance to die through your advanced directive, but it's not being actioned in the Netherlands. No. I was in talking to a colleague there just the other day, and I said to her, Brecky, is, you know, are people's wishes for a, a euthanasia through their advanced directives being honoured? And she said no. And the reason they're not is because the doctors over there have been hammered so much that they are absolutely determined to have prudent practice and for them prudent practice means responding to a current repeated request and if it's in an advanced directive it might not be current. It's true the Netherlands is very interesting that there is a tension between what the law allows and what and what their doctors are prepared to do. I have a sympathy with doctors in this situation because I think it is very difficult for a doctor however well intentioned however much the law may support them to be able to make the choice for somebody that can't speak for themselves. Mm. However having said that uh, dare I use the word tsunami, the, the rising uh, incidence of dementia in all Western society, including ours, I think it is a conversation uh, ethically, legally and medically we will have beyond the assisted dying conversation should and when it becomes law because uh, until we find a way to medically deal with dementia, uh, we are going to have, as we have now, thousands of Australians watching people they love uh, rotting away in homes, and it's a terrible thing. But this, this does speak to the point of transitions that happen in the context of illness, yeah? That what um, we may say at one moment in time may change through the course of our experience, our lived experience, whether that's facing dying or facing dementia. And I, I guess as clinicians by the bedside, we experience that all the time, those changes, those transitions. Um, and then being in the space of dementia makes it much more complicated because the tools that we have developed to help enable patients to mm. make good decisions and to be in charge of their own destinies, mm. they don't work so well where things get grey. And dementia is a grey space. But just quickly, That's... Linda, um, the people that I work with who have dementia, when you first receive your diagnosis, if it's early in the disease process, you have several years of still having capacity. And many of them, once they have completed their advanced directive, the sense of relief, and they say to me, 
I can stop worrying now about the end stage of my life because my family know what I want and they're not going to prolong my dying because we, we've got to change our language and stop talking about prolonging people's lives. Often all we are doing is prolonging their dying. Look, we're not going to solve it here. <laughs> oh, oh, no. We've we got another it. minute. Yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> 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 can, can I just, yes. just I can point just out... see a comment coming from yeah. the sky. Yeah, yeah. Where's the yes. 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 Can I just point out very quickly that um, even though we come from different viewpoints, everybody is on the same page in one respect. We all believe that the person in the bed, the person yes. at the centre of the dying, yes. is the most important person. Absolutely. I think it's crucial to remember that. Yes. So I want to thank you all very, very much indeed. Frank Brennan, Linda Sheehan, Colleen Cartwright, Andrew Denton and Leslie Canold in Melbourne, thank you very much indeed for joining us in this discussion. So maybe we can end with a marvellous Groucho Marx comment that Andrew can probably trump if I give him time, but I won't, who famously said, I intend to live forever or die trying.